Hello and once again welcome to a new series of films for this year. A big thank you once again for all your positive comments and support and a huge thank you to all those who've subscribed to the channel. This time I've been asked to explore the North Yorkshire coast um, inspired by the series I did back in 2020. I did live in this area um, back in the late 1970s so I do have some connection to the area. I'll be travelling uh, from the north to the south along the coast through Cleveland which of course used to be part of North Yorkshire and down as far as the border with Humberside, finishing in the seaside resort of Filey. It's a stunning coastline with the golden sandy beaches, dramatic cliffs and quaint fishing ports, as well as busy seaside resorts. So sit back and enjoy this journey with me. We begin our journey here in Redcar. In recent times, it was famous for its heavy industries like iron and steel and the huge ICI petrochemical plants. Today, a lot of that industry has gone for one reason or another. Um, and as you can see there behind me, there's a wind farm out in the bay. Um, but Redcar wasn't always like that. Redcar is situated on a low-lying site next to the sea. The clue to its origins lie in its name. Kiar, which is a Viking word for marsh, and the Old English word reed, therefore reed kiar. The town began as a fishing hamlet in the 1300s, trading with its larger neighbour of Cotham. That pretty much remained the case until the mid-1800s. A few miles away lies the town of Stockton, which of course became the starting point for Stevenson's steam railway uh, in 1825, between Stockton and Darlington, the first in the world to carry passengers. By 1846, the railways had grown and developed and an extension of the line was built to Redcar, promoting the Victorian idea that sea air was good for health. And so Redcar suddenly boomed as a Victorian seaside resort um, from relative obscurity. The mouth of the River Tees uh, lies just to the north of Redcar, um, and that provided a port for the export of coal, iron and steel and much more. Many ships were wrecked over the centuries trying to navigate their way into that uh, port. Like many towns along the northeast coast, Redcar was given a lifeboat in 1802. It is the oldest surviving lifeboat in the world and named after the Marquis of Zetland, the local lord of the manor. The lifeboat is uh, on display in the museum here in Redcar, um, usually open most days.
In 2006, Red Car was dressed as a Dunkirk beach for the film Atonement, starring Keira Knightley and James McAvoy. Today it continues to be popular with holiday makers and day trippers and has some wonderful shops, parks and a fantastic beach um, for all to enjoy. I would never be forgiven by the people of Cleveland for not including this seaside town in our journey. It's Mask by the Sea. Tourists from outside the region often pronounce it as Mask by the Sea, but to the locals it's Mask. It's widely thought that prehistoric settlements were present all along this coast though little evidence exists to prove that. We know the Romans were here as they built signal towers all along the coast to warn of Viking invasions. And as we've just heard, Red Car was named by the Vikings, so that brings us at least to the 10th century. Mask is first documented by Bishop Egelric in 1042, who consecrated St Germain's Church, which once stood here. Today, the tower has been left, but you can see where the church was. Then it's mentioned in the Doomsday Book, which of course was a survey of all towns and properties in England and Wales, ordered by William the Conqueror. Uh, and that was in 1086. I guess you could liken it to a modern day census. Mask is mentioned again in 1180, when the village was fined 20 pounds for ransacking a Norwegian ship, which probably ran aground here. Like Redcar, Mask existed as a fishing hamlet in the Middle Ages until it prospered in the Victorian era with the extension of the Stockton to Darlington Railway. Landmarks here include Mask Hall, originally built in 1625 for the Zetland family, who we will hear more about at our next stop. The hall was gifted to the Leonard Cheshire charity as a disabled rehabilitation establishment in 1964 until it was sold to a private owner in 2019. Cliff House overlooks the bay and belonged to a Joseph Pease, very important character um, that we'll be talking about again on this journey. He was the principal shareholder of the Stockton and Darlington Railway Company and played a major part in the development of this whole area. 
During the First World War, Mask lay claim to having the Bristol M1C monoplane, nicknamed the Red Devil, based here at Mask Aerodrome. It was the only single-winged fighter put into mass production during World War I. The author of the Biggles books, Captain W.E. Johns, served at the aerodrome and his stories were imagined here. The aerodrome is no longer here but the runways are still visible from the air. Apart from the lovely beach, um, a tourist attraction here is Winky's Castle. Obviously not a castle but dates back to the 1600s. It was formerly owned by the local shoemaker, Jack Anderson, and the cottage was named after Jack's cat, Winky. It is now a local museum run by volunteers with over 6,000 items on rotational display. It's not open today, um, but an exciting development uh, from the museum is the release of a new book um, of photographs called Then and Now and a comparison to pictures taken today to how it was in its heyday in the Victorian period. So look out for that when you come to visit. Okay, I'm now going to introduce you to two ladies who are responsible for the Scarecrow Festival. Hello, I'm Anne. Uh, and this year I've been helping to organise the Scarecrow Festival, uh, which was originally started by... Barbara Barbara. Lambert. And I've lived in this area for quite a long time, 40 odd years on and off, and um, been on the Musk Community Partnership, which is a an organisation that we started about 1999, I believe, and we've been trying to arrange events that interest the public for a long time, and eventually we ran out of ideas, except I've always been in, into puppetry and figure making. The advantage of these festivals is that it, it's a family thing, and it involves um, a terrific number of um, age groups and also it, 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 um, the creative spirit arises with everybody. They suddenly think, oh, I can do that. So we think of a topic. This year it was obviously royal for the passing and jubilee of Queen Elizabeth II, so that wasn't too difficult to organise. I think we, we encouraged the shops to, to take part the first year by putting scarecrows crows out that represented their trade or business. And that was very successful, and they realised that it increased the footfall about 100%. Um, and so they were on board from day one. And here we are again, yes. Yeah.
There are no clear records to show the origins of salt burn, but again we know of the prehistoric Roman and Viking presence here. In recent history it began as an inn and a row of fishermen's cottages which you can see behind me and it was known as Saltburn Gill. It was well known as a centre for smugglers and the publican at the inn, John Andrew, was referred to as the king of the smugglers. Saltburn, along with Redcar, Mask and all the towns in this region were formerly part of the North Riding in the county of York, which was owned by the Dundas family, a very wealthy family owning much of Scotland as well. They began as barons and then progressed to earls and gained the title Earls of Zetland. The name is an ancient derivative of Shetland. They eventually became the Marquesses of Zetland by 1892. The Dundas family were also Lord Lieutenants of Ireland, Orkney and Shetland. Saltburn Gill became Saltburn by the Sea in the Victorian era with the coming of the railway. The land here was purchased from the Earl of Zetland in the 1860s by a Henry Pease, the son of Joseph and the principal shareholder in the Stockton and Darlington Railway. He envisaged a new seaside town served by the railway and wanted the valley containing Skelton Beck turned into ornamental gardens. Saltburn by Sea quickly became a very popular Victorian seaside resort with a pier built in 1869 and a water powered funicular cliff lift opened in 1884. It still runs today and is one of the world's oldest water powered lifts. Where this bandstand is uh, situated today there was once a bridge spanning 650 feet across the glen from west to east. It consisted of seven cast iron trestles of varying heights supporting lattice girders with a roadway and a footpath across the top. It was constructed to connect some um, expensive villas on one side of the valley with the town centre. Um, it was built in 1868 and the charge for a pedestrian crossing was one old half penny. So it's hardly surprising then and it got the nickname of the Hapney Bridge. Um, it was demolished on the 17th of December 1974 as it was in a dangerous condition and as I say the bandstand that uh, is here now is um, on the site of where that bridge was. Saltburn remains a popular seaside resort with a busy seafront and pier, bespoke shops, delicatessens, hotels and eating places and so much more. If you're coming for a day trip or a longer stay you will find plenty to do here.
This seemingly inconspicuous settlement has a very, very important history. Its name is Skinning Grove, and the word comes from the Old Norse, Skinara Griffia, Skinner's Grove or Ravine, referring to the leather tanning industry that existed here in the 9th century. The area's history goes back much further to at least 5000 BC when a Bronze Age settlement existed here. As early as 800 BC, iron was discovered uh, in the area around here. And of course, it then became an Iron Age settlement. From 100 to 420 AD, it was the Romans who were here and they had a signal tower up on the headland over there. Um, when they left, it was occupied by the Angles um, from the area we now know as uh, Denmark and uh, northern Germany, and that formed the part of the kingdom of Dera, as it was known then, and of course that later became the kingdom of Northumbria. In the 9th century, it was occupied by the Vikings under Danelaw, um, and that's when the village acquired its name Skinara Griffia, or Skinning Grove as it is today. The 11th century saw the arrival of the Normans, but the settlement here remained reliant on farming and fishing throughout the Middle Ages until the late 1500s when the deposits of alum were discovered under the Cleveland Hills. Alum is a colourless crystal and a mixture of two sulphates, aluminium and either potassium or ammonium. It was Thomas Chaloner who, on a visit to Italy in the late 1500s, saw how the alum ore was used to cure leather and fix dyes on cloth. We will find out more about its importance as we visit other locations on our journey down the coast. In the 16th century, the mineral was quarried at the surface, whereas today it is mined. The mine at Boulby, which is close by, is still mining the ore today and is the deepest mineral mine in Britain, currently at a depth of 1,400 metres, and the workings stretch right out under the North Sea. Uh, and in case you're wondering, Thomas Chaloner was a rich landowner in nearby Gisborough uh, and he noticed that the alum underneath his property was the same as that in Italy. So that's where the connection is. In 1848, an ironstone mine was opened in nearby Loftus. Then, after the railways arrived in the 1860s, the iron-rich Cleveland Hills could be exploited and Skinning Grove was at the epicentre of that. To begin with, the ironstone was put into barges and sailed north to Middlesbrough before being transported onward by rail to ironworks in Durham. Henry Pease bought the mine in the late 1860s and extended the rail network to Skinning Grove by the late 1800s, the export of iron had expanded and supplies were feeding the steelworks in Grangemouth in Scotland. Transport by rail was beginning to become expensive and so a substantial jetty was built. You can see the remains of it there behind me. Um, replacing an earlier, more flimsy wooden jetty. 
so the ore could be loaded onto boats for transportation to Grangemouth. The boats could only be loaded at high tide because of the very shallow bay here and so loading was done at a furious pace. By the early 20th century, Skinning Grove had its own steelworks along with those on Teesside and so the export of ironstone ceased and the jetty fell into decline. In World War II, engineers tried to blow up the jetty to prevent an enemy invasion landing here, but failed to destroy it as it was built so robustly. The late 20th century saw the closure of the mines and the sad decline of the village. Today, its residents commute to nearby Gisborough, Boolby and Redcar for work. In the year 2000, Skinning Grove was flooded twice, both in July and November of that year. Continual heavy rainfall had caused Kilton and Whitecliff Becks to overflow into Skinning Grove Beck. If you're not familiar with the local dialect, a beck in Yorkshire is the word for a small river or rivulet. Debris and fallen trees had blocked the bridge, causing the water to build up behind and flood the entire village. More than 100 homes were affected and the villagers had to be evacuated. The Environment Agency has since installed these defensive water gates. Uh, and the Environment Wardens patrol whenever the weather looks dangerous. The village has a mining museum showing its proud history. Um, at present though it is undergoing an expansion uh, which looks quite extensive and impressive um, so it's not open to the public uh, here now when, while I'm here filming um, so I suggest you check their website for its reopening schedule. The Cleveland Way passes through here bringing walkers from far and wide but by far the best attribute Skinning Grove has is Catasty Sands. And if I just move over here, there's a small gap in that jetty. And it's a bit like walking through the wardrobe door into Narnia. Because here it's, you can still see the remnants of the industry, but you walk through that little gap and you'll see how magnificent the beach is on the other side. There's a small free car park which you can just see over there on the other side of the river um, and a short walk from that car park um, you get to the gap through the jetty that brings you to this amazing beach. There's no ice cream parlours or donkey rides, but miles of golden sand and clear blue sea. So if you're looking for an inexpensive day out, this is your answer. Just remember to bring your flask.
Well, that's all for this episode. I hope you've enjoyed the journey so far. Please join us next time when we will be venturing a little further south uh, along this beautiful coast. Um, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and activate the notification icon so you will know when the next instalment is released. Goodbye for now and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Thank you.